Uh, good morning and thank you again for coming here. I'd like to also thank Nick of Sukasa for hosting us. He has been a mainstay and a courageous champion for Ellicott City and for businesses. And I really appreciate all of the hard work and engagement by the residents, businesses, dedicated men and women uh, with the Howard County government, our nonprofit partners such as EcoWorks and the Ellicott City Partnership and Visit Howard County. I also want to just thank all of the delegates and senators from our Howard County delegation who worked quite hard during this last General Assembly session to pass that significant legislation for the much needed state funding to assist our efforts here in Ellicott City. I'd like to again thank Delegate Courtney Watson and Senator Katie Fry Hester for their work in securing that $3.4 million and for the $8 million over the next three years. Since taking office, developing a plan for Ellicott City that prioritizes public safety, ensures economic vitality, and retains as much of the town's historic charm as possible has been a priority for my administration. Within three weeks of taking office, I announced the first phase of my Ellicott City Safe and Sound Plan, a multi-phase plan built around the need for public safety, supporting businesses and property owners, preparing our county for changing climate and creating a more inclusive and collaborative process for decisions regarding Ellicott City's future. The initiatives included in phase one are already paying dividends for our community. Previously, Howard County was only clearing streams and waterways on a quarterly basis, even after the 2016 and 2018 floods. I found that unacceptable. And I wanted an enhanced stream cleaning program which now requires that the waterways in and around Ellicott City are inspected after every major storm event. And this new program has already been triggered twice in the past two months alone, resulting in the clearing of several tons of debris from our waterways. Clearing these waterways is a critical step toward keeping potentially harmful debris out of our waterways and reducing flooding. And I'd like to again thank Lori Lilly and EcoWorks for their partnerships in this important program. An additional element that I announced as part of my phase, phase one safe and sound plan was to create a robust emergency alert system for Ellicott City residents, businesses, and visitors. This is another example of a critical component to public safety that was not implemented immediately after the 2016 or 18 floods that I wanted to implement with a greater sense of urgency. To ensure that residents business owners and visitors to Ellicott City have as much notice as possible in advance of severe weather events. I asked our Office of Emergency Management to purchase two temporary mobile speaker arrays, one of which was just delivered last week, and the other we're expecting to be delivered today. I want to thank Ryan Miller and his team for all of their work throughout the 2016-18 floods and for being a great partner for me in emergency management. And thank you all for voting on the tones and when the system goes live in the coming weeks we will begin testing those tones starting with the one that received the most votes to determine which one works best. An initial testing schedule will be released prior to the start of testing to ensure everyone is fully informed. Stay tuned for that announcement from OEM on the next meeting date on the emergency alert system. In addition to the speakers, we will also be bringing back the video messaging boards.
which have all been upgraded to allow our public safety professionals to change out the messages from a remote location. And as we increase preparations for the next big storm, which we know will come, we have also stepped up our efforts to assist those impacted by prior weather events and help prepare for those in the future. Our Flood Mitigation Assistant Pilot, Assistance Pilot Program grant, grant program that I launched will be making awards by the end of this month so that property owners can uh, perform the much needed flood proofing projects in their structures and we already have 38 applications for that. We also have our new ombudsman for Ellicott City in attendance, Tony Summers, raise your hand Tony, right there in the back, is an experienced retail professional who will be helping Ellicott City businesses in any way that he can. Tony is a great guy and if you haven't had the chance to meet Tony, please go say hi after the announcement. And with Tony, the residences and businesses in Ellicott City will now have a point person to directly connect them with the resources and effort of our Economic Development Authority. And the recently created Community Development Corporation Exploration Committee continues to meet and will be releasing their report next month. We're quickly approaching the first anniversary of the 2018 flood. We need bold, innovative solutions that won't be a band-aid for this town until the next storm. We need long-term, sustainable planning that will reduce the amount of potential flood water in Ellicott City, make our town safer, and respect the taxpayer investment. As part of Phase 1, I announced that we will be looking at options for flood mitigation that make us safer while preserving as much of the historic cultural charm of Ellicott City as possible. I wanted to know if there were options available that allowed us to save at least some of the 10 buildings slated for demolition. I wanted to explore options to take more water off Lower Main Street and away from the West End. And recognizing the incredible sense of urgency of the problem at hand, I wanted to do it as quickly as possible, but I wanted to do it right. Phase two represents the results of this analysis, one that included not new studies, but instead looking at information in a new way. The previous flood mitigation plan for Ellicott City was built on the premise of what can be accomplished in five years. And while urgency is important, it's also important to have a plan that allows for Ellicott City, a town now approaching 250 years old, to be safe and thriving, not just for the next five years, but frankly, for the next 255 years. Today, I'm proud to share with you what I feel are the five best options for flood mitigation. Each option represents a comprehensive collection of flood mitigation project, projects that result in less water on Main Street than the previous plan and put public safety above all else. I'm committed to you that this process will be inclusive and transparent, which is why I'm soliciting your input on these options. We will hold a public meeting May 2nd at Howard High School at 7 p.m. And during this meeting, I, along with representatives of my team, will again provide a brief overview of the initiatives included in phase two of the plan and will be ready to address your questions and your concerns. You can also submit comments on the Safe and Sound website. And after we have reviewed those con comments, I'll be making a final decision on which plan to pursue no later than May 15th. These five options vary in terms of the projects they include and therefore have slightly different estimated costs and timelines. But all of these projects have a few things in common. One, they all include a mix of retention and conveyance projects that are designed to keep water in channels as much as possible. Two, they all retain at least some of the buildings on Lower Main Street 
that were previously designated for demolition. And three, they all represent significant mitigation efforts that will result in less water on Main Street than the previous plan. And you can see the water depths comparison chart. We're moving with a sense of urgency and with a sense of careful purpose on all of these projects because I know that the decisions made today will have lasting impacts for tomorrow. We have not slowed down on any of the essential or timely projects and processes of the previous plan over the last four months. To the contrary, we have greatly enhanced that plan and are willing to invest the resources needed to mitigate future expenses if severe weather strikes Ellicott City in the way that it had previously, which not only keeps safety at the forefront, but yield a better return on investment for all taxpayers. As we see the increasing frequency and intensity of severe weather, we cannot go halfway in addressing the continued threat of flooding in Ellicott City, only to possibly be back here again in a few years. The threat is real, the threat is grave, and we will finally take strong action. I'm excited to announce that over the next several months there will also be an external peer review performed by a team of national experts assembled by the Army Corps of Engineers. And I look forward to receiving their report and we'll be ready to adapt our plan if necessary. And while we will still be making progress with that sense of urgency, through this peer review process, we will have experts making sure that we were making the best decisions and the wisest investments to create the most secure and safe future for Ellicott City, which will allow us to adjust as new information becomes available. And as we make the final decision on which option is best for Ellicott City, we must also finish acquiring private properties that are needed to help in these mitigation efforts. All five of our flood mitigation options call for demolishing at least four of the buildings in order to complete the much needed capital projects to construct culverts under Maryland Avenue, while one option calls for the, demol the demolition of six buildings. And you can see building acquisition aerial map. The buildings that will remain will need to have some demolition or modification to remove any portions that constrict the stream. In order to perform these modifications, the county will be required to undergo a federal section 106 process, which is a federal process to help preserve historic properties. This process can be lengthy, but we will do everything in our power to expedite this process. It is important to note that the buildings we are keeping will remain a public asset until all flood, mit flood mitigation projects are complete. This will allow the county to control occupancy, particularly when there is the potential of severe, of severe weather. And while the Section 106 process is underway, we will be doing an analysis to determine which is the best public use for these buildings. Please take note, when I took office, the county didn't own any of those buildings and was very early in the negotiation process. And as of today, we have acquired 10 properties, seven on Main Street, two in Valley Mead, and one in the West End. One additional property on Lower Main Street should be settled in the coming weeks. And starting in fiscal year 2020, we plan to begin the acquisition process for additional properties in Valley Mead and the West End. And an estimated timeline for these acquisitions will be available on our EC Safe and Sound website. For the buildings we now own on Lower Main Street, immediate steps will be taken to remove the blight and ensure the stability of these buildings. These efforts could not have begun before we actually owned the properties. The interiors of these buildings will be cleaned, the facades will be repaired, 
This includes replacing damaged windows and doors and creating display windows to make Ellicott City even more welcoming. We will be filling in basements of a few, building, of a few buildings to improve the structural stability. And one building that requires immediate action is the Kaplan's building. We are seeking to demolish the portion over the stream quickly due to concerns about structural integrity. And these actions will allow us to maintain the economic viability of Main Street, the commercial center of this town. And while those who live, work, and frequent historic Ellicott City may be familiar with the various ways to get to higher ground, we recognize and we welcome that we have first-time visitors to our town each and every day. And past floods have proven that seconds matter. So when there are flash flood warnings in the future, when the outdoor emergency alert system sounds, we want to make sure that everyone knows the fastest ways to move to higher ground. And we'll, we will be strategically locating signs throughout the town that clearly point to higher ground. You can see some of those areas here. And these signs, which Connor's holding up very kindly, thank you, will show the way up and out of the floodplain. And they are noted by those on, orange squares on the large foam board. And these signs will offer, and he's holding another, <laughs> these signs will offer guidance to remind everyone that when the tones sound, seek higher ground. These signs are noted by the blue squares on the large foam board here. We want to stress that in a flash flood emergency, do not walk or drive through moving water. Do not go to your car. Look for these high ground access signs and immediately move out of the floodplain when the tones sound. In addition, we will encourage our restaurants and shops to share the information with their customers. And we will assist them by providing things like table scents, signs, and window clings. We all know that a prepared community is a safer community. And a safer community begins with each and every one of us. As part of the phase two, I'll be unveiling our new capital projects tracker. You can see an example over there. This tracker will launch once the final phase two plan is selected. And this online tool will allow individuals to follow the progress of each and every mitigation project. It will show the status of the building demolitions and renovations happening on Main Street. And I know that our community is eager for measurable progress, and this tool will promote transparency on all of our important projects. The Ellicott City Master Plan, started in 2016, had been halted after the 2018 flood and was in limbo when I took office. Today I'm announcing that the master planning process will resume effective June 1st. The residents, businesses, and stakeholders of Ellicott City deserve to have clarity and certainty on our town's future. Our Department of Planning and Zoning will be leading this effort. And like all master planning processes, this process will be critical to making sure that historic Ellicott City is preserved while its economic vitality and potential is expanded. There will be multiple opportunities for their input as we complete this master plan process. Regardless of the final flood mitigation option selected under phase two of our safe and sound plan, our capital needs will be significant. To support our efforts, our administration and our dedicated partners in the state delegation have been hard at work securing millions of dollars. And you can see the foam board. In new funding, this is new funding that we did not have prior to me taking office. Delegate Watson referred to the $3.4 million in state capital funding to, dedicated to Ellicott City flood mitigation. 
We also secured $250,000 from our state supplemental budget for a permanent alert system. And I'm pleased to announce today two brand new sources of funding. $700,000 from the State Department of Housing and Community Development for stabilization, cleanup, and facade projects, which was secured just this week. And $3.5 million toward our Ellicott City efforts. We are receiving in cost savings by the state allowing us to now purchase the land for the new Waterloo Fire Station for just $1 and finally get that project back on track. We were just informed of this transaction and it will be before the Board of Public Works next week. I want to take a moment to thank the Secretary of Department of Housing and Community Development, Governor Hogan, Lieutenant, Gov Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford, Senate President Mike Miller, and our recently departed Speaker of the House, Mike Bush, for their support and dedication to the residents here in Ellicott City. These dollars are in addition to the more than $15 million that I've placed in my proposed capital budget for Ellicott City flood mitigation, which I released earlier this month. As I said when I announced our safe and sound plan in December, Ellicott City is one of Howard County's most important cultural and economic resources. Its safety and security are critical to our county's future prosperity. Crafting bold, workable, community engaged, innovative, common sense solutions for Ellicott City has been an immediate priority. And by building the infrastructure necessary to improve public safety, we will create a future for Ellicott City that gives businesses a reason to invest, maintains our cultural value, helps to protect our town from an ever-changing climate, and makes us the national model for safety, strength, and resilience. Thank you all for your continued engagement, vigilance, and determination in making Ellicott City safe and sound. So we have some of uh, my team here. Come on up. Come on up. We're going to be taking some questions. Oh. So we have been joined by Senator Hester and Delegate Hill. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. Um, so you have um, announced a lot of funding, but that's nowhere near the $173 million potentially that the county will need. Have you guys identified any other sources for funding or hopeful that these bonds or more state funding or federal funding? So we are very excited by the partnership that we've had with our state partners. Uh, when I met with Governor Hogan within my first 30 days of taking office, I talked about priorities for Howard County. And he has been a partner not only through the Department of Housing and Community Development, but Board of Public Works and others to make sure that we continue to get the state funding invested in Ellicott City. And I think in just four months, We've demonstrated an ability to work with uh, Delegate Watson, Senator Hester, our delegation, all of our uh, state partners to secure more funding. Also, please note that these plans are multi-year plans, and so each year we will continue to invest in all of Howard County, but also Ellicott City. Can I follow up on that? Um, mm -hmm. uh, people who are going to be going online and looking at these plans and voting on the costs, are you saying you don't have money secured or how much do you have how much does the county have to pay toward what's needed and how much are you hoping the state will will contribute so my hope is that when people go and give their comments on the plans, they look at the plans in their entirety. They think about what will make Ellicott City safe, 
and viable and be an investment on taxpayer dollars. And so we can do the cost benefit analysis uh, in a community conversation about those dollars. Each year we will be investing money for those flood mitigation efforts. And we are going to have partners such as state. We're going to have partners who are here in Ellicott City. And each year we're going to make progress. But it won't be done in a day or even with one budget. So just to clarify, it sounds like you're not ready to talk hard numbers right now. Well, I think we're talking hard numbers, but no, we do not have $200 million secured uh, today. Uh, just like any other multi-year plan, we're going to make progress every year. We couldn't even use the $200 million if we had it secured today. Any concerns that trying to pick a plan through this method of community input, you know, lined up with aiming for a horse but designing a camel instead? So I think in, in putting together the five best plans, we have the community being able to do a cost-benefit analysis on each. I committed to having a transparent, collaborative process. I could have just selected either the most expensive, the least expensive, or the fastest plan. But as we are continuing to move forward with projects that were already in the pipeline, that move flood mitigation efforts and stormwater remediation efforts forward, I think I owe it to our community to have this community conversation. And I trust that our community will weigh in with a thoughtful response. In the end, I am the county executive and I will be making a decision based upon uh, that community input. But I think our community, we will work together to have a shared plan. I have a question for CW. Yes. Um, uh, it looks like to someone who does this for a living, that the most expensive, longest timeline plan that would reduce the water the most is to build tunnels. Can you explain the thought behind that? <clears throat> so the, uh, the scenarios, two of the scenarios show tunnels. And so, uh, and they may get the most dramatic result on Lower Main Street. So one tunnel we, we call the North Tunnel, and uh, then there is a South Tunnel. The North Tunnel would, uh, for those familiar with uh, landmarks in Ellicott City, the, the North Tunnel would start near Ellicott Mills Road in parking lot F, and then go travel uh, under the ground 80 to 100 feet and empty into the Patapsco. So by having a tunnel, it allows us to take most of the uh, flood water um, that occurs during these fl flash floods and carry it away before it has a chance to, before the Hudson has a chance to wind through the town and join up with the Tiber and cause flooding uh, on the street and uh, excessive volumes of water at the lower end. And the South Tunnel, where would that be? So the South Tunnel uh, is still in like a concept phase of exactly where it would be located, but it would be located somewhere to catch partially uh, the New Cut, partially the Tiber, which is you know further east of uh, where the North Tunnel starts, and on the south side of the street. So that would that tunnel would primarily work the same way. It would catch a lot of the excess flow um, that causes the Tiber behind the buildings on Main Street causes all the destruction. So this tunnel would catch that excess and carry it away similarly, you know, under the ground, um, not as deeply, but under the ground, and then uh, empty into the Patapsco. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little confused. Sorry, sorry. Um, you once told me that tunnel were only viable if the Patapsco stays at a certain level. So why is it included in the options? Um, that's true. Uh, however, the way th that we are looking at these tunnels uh, and the volume of water that we'll be pushing through the tunnels um, would more than compensate for the height of the Patapsco. And without getting too far into the weeds, it, it works hydraulically. Uh, what we were most concerned with at the time with some of the preliminary studies that we had done was that we would lose the efficiency of the tunnel. 
uh, because of this tailwater at the Patapsco. But we've worked through these uh, preliminary concepts uh, further and so we, we feel that we can push that water through. Uh, also, I think that these tunnels work the best during flash floods. It doesn't address, and it's a totally different kind of flood condition if the Patapsco River were to flood. But these, flo these tunnels address the, the flash floods that we've had uh, in 2011, essentially, was a flash flood. 2016 and 2018. So there are other scenarios besides the tunnel scenarios that, that do work. Uh, they may not be as effective on Lower Main as the, the tunnel options. And so uh, as you're, you know, I'm sure many people will gravitate towards the tunnel options. However, there are other options. Uh, three out of the five do not have tunnels. and. Um, and so they and they do produce results as well. Mark, since you're up there, can I ask about what everyone's asking me is about when will Elephant Mills Drive be open? Um, and I know that the weather, the, the constant rain, has been an issue for the crews down there. And we're we're looking at yet another day of severe weather on Friday. How does that real time um, the real time weather? challenges you're facing, how will that impact what's happening now and I don't know, the urgency perhaps of the plan. Right. Like that. So no doubt we've had the wettest fall and winter we've had in quite some time. Right now, uh, this phase of construction, there are certain phases of construction that are more affected by the weather than others. And um, the weather has played havoc with those most sensitive to the weather. Those parts of construction most sensitive to the weather. So right now we're in an earth operation. We're bringing fill. We're bringing the earth up so that we can actually create the roadbed. It's very susceptible to weather conditions like rain because you know it makes the ground wet and then we can't really place it, uh, place the soil. So it does affect the sk overall schedule, but we're hopeful that we're looking at uh, a late spring or early summer uh, opening of the road. Now that can, with one caveat, and that's the weather. And so hopefully, you know, we'll we'll get a string of days. Uh, we'll be able to string some days together, where we will be able to finish the earthwork. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a question about sort of the flood mitigation. Uh, sorry, the flood emergency. Uh, okay. So I just wanted to quickly touch on the, those last two topics. Um, first, on the tunneling. I think that we heard loud and clear from our community that we wanted bold, innovative thinking that would solve the problem. And we needed to have at least a community conversation to evaluate tunnels. We can look at the best technology of today and not just yesterday to try to address the issues and problems of today and into tomorrow. And on the opening of the road, every day I ask our team, when can we get that road open? Yes. And so there have been some challenges with the weather. I've been strongly encouraging us to do whatever we can to overcome those challenges. I think there's a balance between um, not only getting the funding reimbursement and the weather, but as Mark indicated, the points at which we are in moving forward, which have been quite sensitive to the weather. But each and every day, it is a priority and a topic of conversation with me and somebody on my team when are we getting that road open? Thank you. Yes. Um, so I have a question about the flood emergency alert system. Um, I have heard concern that you know it might drive visitors away just because that, that sort of panic, right? So can you guys talk a little bit more about when exactly that will sound and how to make sure that there aren't exactly false alarms? Can you speak to the flood emergency alert system? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Mike Henson, Acting Director, Office of Emergency Management. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you back there. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, I, I've heard some concerns that with the flood emergency alert system, it may drive visitors away because it induces panic and whatnot. Um, so what's, 
how do we make sure that the alert system will sound like there's actual threat and not just false alarms? Sure. So the system will sound um, in two different manners. Uh, first, there is automated uh, alerts that will come out from the National Weather Service uh, that will automatically trigger the system. Um, so those are confirmed uh, imminent threats. In addition to that, <clears throat> several members of county staff will also have the ability to trigger the system uh, and they will have that through confirmed boots on the ground reports of flooding on the street. So I just wanted to quickly weigh in on the emergency alert. One of my frustrations has been ever since the 2018 flood, whenever we get any rain, people are afraid to come to Ellicott City, even if it's not particularly dangerous. And I want people to understand, come to Ellicott City, support our businesses, make sure that you can visit this wonderful historic cultural town. When it is an imminent danger and threat. We will have these emergency tones and we will be on it and taking care of it and I trust my team to alert people when they can. But again, if it's light rain, if it's misting, we're still open for business. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, the, every plan requires at least four buildings to be demolished. Or is it the same four buildings in every plan? Um, and which ones are they? So I'm going to introduce myself. I forgot to do that. I'm Mark DeLuca. Uh, I'm Deputy Director of Public Works. So I think we have a board that shows, and I'll wait for that to be revealed, but in the meantime I'll say that the four buildings, the analysis that took place emphasized trying to save um, as many of the structures as possible. And it came down to uh, four structures that because of um, certain pipe configurations to the Patapsco River, we needed, to, we needed to look at removing four of these buildings as opposed to the 10 buildings. So these four buildings and at least um, four of the options, four of the five options, um, are the last four buildings on Main Street. So they start on Maryland Avenue and Main, and then uh, that would be the first building, and then they just work their way up. Um, so they're the, the last four buildings on Main Street. On that one side? On the south side. So you have right. the numbers? So I believe that they're on the graphic. I believe they're on the board. I don't know them. So the additional two, uh, in one of the scenarios, we looked at uh, two more buildings, and then it's just the next two buildings up. So uh, essentially, from Tiber, I believe it's from Tiber, the four buildings, it starts at Tiber Alley and goes to Main Street. Those properties between Tiber Alley and Main Street are the four structures that need to come down, I believe, in four out of the five scenarios that we, we are presenting. There is a, one scenario that has six, and so then it would be the next two buildings up from Tiber Alley. Thank you. All right, last question. Okay, um, The previous administration had um, like a preliminary look at what it would look like under the old plan. Is that, can that still apply to this? Because it was like an open space and park. Is that still a thing or not? So, that hasn't been as well developed right now. It's part of that that um, concept came from the master plan, and they are, as um, Executive Ball said, they are engaged again, and I'm sure they're going to be looking at what they can do with that space, um, where the four buildings will will be coming down. So just to clarify, it's not going to look like that. Is that what you're saying? It won't look like a hole in the ground. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. I'm just I'm wondering if I can share a story that says this is my, like it might look like this because that's what they said last. Right. So, I don't know if you want to. So no, we don't have artist renderings of what these things could look like. We literally wanted to get you 
the information as soon as possible of the different options and begin that community conversation. I think once an option is selected, then we can draw lots of pretty pictures. I, I just wanted to publicly thank all of our team. They have been working tirelessly, not just with my administration, through the 18 throat flood, through the 16, some from the 11. They've been working so hard. And the evolution that you see here is me asking different questions, asking questions in a different way, sometimes with new technology, more information. And so I really appreciate all of their hard work and all of the town's hard work and getting us to this point where we are going to be that example. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.